Hello class. I would like to tell you the purpose of today's lecture. And what it has to do with, it has to do with the special case of the central limit theorem. So in the previous lecture, we uh, stated the central limit theorem. And the the Moiver, the Moiver Laplace theorem and the Moiver Laplace limit theorem is a special case of the central limit theorem. I want to quickly remind you again what the limit theorem, what the, the Moiver Laplace limit theorem is. So you would say, how about we just forget about this theorem completely and just learn the central limit theorem because it's more general. And you can do that, but here's the issues that one comes across. So to prove the central limit theorem, uh, one needs uh, more tools. And I would really say it's from analysis. Uh, the main tool, it's the Fourier transform. You basically solve the problem with the Fourier transform. If you know what I'm talking about, it's sometimes referred to as the characteristic function of a random variable, but it really is the Fourier transform. And then one has to define what the Fourier transform is, properties, and all of that. And the issue is you sort of get very sidetracked by all of that. But the other problem would be, and whereas the proof of the Moivre's theorem is more direct, we already have the tools in order to prove it. So it's a lot more direct. But the other problem is, and I think this is more serious, historically, uh, de Moivre was the first person Uh, to motivate. And I think this is the most important part. Mathematics is about motivations. You have to motivate an idea. It's one thing to just write something down and then you see that it works, but it's unclear why it works. But the motivation is really more important. He was the first person to motivate the function, this function phi of x. This is the standard normal density function, which is given by this. His derivation of this theorem naturally led to such a function. This function was not just randomly invented out of nowhere. There was a purpose that led to it, and it very naturally comes up when you derive this limit theorem. So what does the theorem say? So the theorem says, let me remind you again, we're going to state this theorem in the notation of random walks, the Moivre stated the theorem in terms of the binomial random variable. They really are equivalent to each other because as we saw, the binomial is just a shifted version of a random walk. And it says that if Wn is a symmetric random walk up to time n, and you can also add starting at zero. Then for numbers, for real numbers, A less than B, these are real numbers. And they can even be extended real numbers. So you could make them plus and minus infinity. We have that. If you want to calculate the probability that the standardized, so you standardize your random walk between these two numbers, uh, the reason for doing this is because this random variable, its variance is equal to one, then the probability that this random variable falls in between these two numbers can be approximated using an integral instead. So you would say it's 
approximately equal to, but the idea is we're going to consider the limit. You turn this into inequality by saying this is exactly equal to if you were to take the limit as n goes to infinity, and then out of this you get an integral. So this is the integral of a to b of phi of x dx, where phi is this function right over here. Now, actually, uh, de Moiver did not know the constant. He knew this was the function. So what de Moiver had is he really said that there is some constant so that the probability of this will, it's this, inter he got the correct function up to a constant, and then the constant was figured out later on. So now we know this constant is 1 over the square root of pi. I'm sorry, 1 over the square root of 2 pi. And this is what we call the de Moivre Laplace limit theorem. And essentially what he did, and we will see this, is he calculated the probability of this, that that is, he calculated the exact probability as a sum, and then he saw that that sum can be estimated by an integral. And from a calculation purpose, this is something that is not too bad to calculate, whereas calculating the exact probability of that requires you to deal with ridiculously large numbers that even computers today have problems computing. Back then, that was just impossible to even compute. So he really was just trying to more effectively compute these probabilities, and he realized that you can turn this calculation into that where it's possible to, to do. And that was really... Uh, what, how he discovered this function uh, phi of x that we call the standard normal density function. And the nice thing about this derivation is you're motivating where that function arises from. It's no longer a magical function out of nowhere, but you get to see it. And my issue, my biggest issue with the proof of the modern central limit theorem is what makes this function very special is that its Fourier transform is itself. That's a very important part of the proof of the modern central limit theorem. And the, the issue is that the reason why the Fourier transform of it is itself is because you just do the calculation. But if one never motivated this function in the first place and you never had to find its Fourier transform, you would never have the modern central limit theorem. So you, you have to motivate it first. So we have the tools to prove this theorem and we get to motivate it and that's why we want to do that. So in the previous lecture, when we talked about the central limit theorem, we did not prove anything. We just stated the theorem, and I wanted to state the modern central limit theorem because it's so important and people should know what it is. But now that we're talking about random walks, uh, we, can prove, we can prove a special case of it and motivate the standard normal density function. Now, I wanted to say something else about this. So generally what we do like in real life and applications, this is the math, This is a precise math, uh, mathematical statement, but we say that if this n is a large number, which is precisely the case when this is difficult to compute exactly, we have this approximation. And I mentioned that the there's something called the Berry Essene theorem, which uh, basically, I do not want to write it out formally because we do not need it. But we're never going to use it, which basically says the error is about 1 over square root of n, which is, uh, this is uh, rather bad. That's a rather bad estimate. Because if n is 1,000, well, let's say, yeah, so if n is a million, then the square root of a million is... A thousand. So you're saying you're getting the answer within one thousandths of what it is, and it sounds it should be a lot better if it's a million. So it's a pretty bad estimate. However, and this is what I was trying to say, is that um, the theorem. So this the, so this estimate is really about uh, the worst case scenario. You can get uh, better estimates depending on uh, on some assumptions about your random variable when you use the central limit theorem. 
And I did not mention this in the last lecture, but Shiryaev makes a very good point. So this is the probability book that I was mentioning in uh, last class. And I looked into his section on the De Moivre Laplace limit theorem, and he said something interesting. He said that the uh, De, Moivre, De Moivre theorem or central limit theorem is most accurate when the random walk is symmetric, which is exactly what we're doing. And it becomes less accurate the more skewed uh, the random walk becomes. So basically what we're saying is your random walk is an independent sum of coin tosses where x i the sequence is independent and the probability that x i is equal to 1 and the probability that x i is equal to negative 1 we have been assuming they're equally likely 1 half and 1 half but if it's more skewed to be heads this can be 95 percent and that could be 5 percent and then when you form the standardized average in the central limit theorem and you estimate it with the standard normal density function you will have a much worse approximation so the more skewed it is towards heads or tails the worse approximation becomes and so this factor will become a lot more pronounced in those cases but in the symmetric case it happens to be a lot better so that's just something we need to understand that the barrier scene theorem is about the really the worst case scenario that one has and even in the context of random walks the worst case scenario begins to happen as head or tails becomes extremely more favored now let's talk about some history which is quite interesting First, let me show you the Wikipedia page on De Moivre. And this is a mathematician I've heard about for a long time. I have knew about him, but I never realized how early he was. So he was born in 1667. And Newton, I believe, we can look it up, but I think he was born in 1642. So he's almost the same time, almost the exact same time as Newton. So this means that... De Moivre, and by the way, I should say I, I have no idea how to pronounce his name. So I'm almost certain I'm pronouncing his name completely wrong from what it's supposed to be. But De Moivre, he lived right together with Newton. So that's right during the time period of when calculus was being developed. So for him to come up with his contributions in mathematics, it makes it even more impressive given the fact how early that was. So uh, this is when he was born. And then The Doctrine of Chances, the book that he written on probability theory, appeared in 1718. So really, that's very early on in math history, very early on uh, during the development of calculus, which I think it just makes it even more impressive that he uh, made those kinds of contributions. And you can also find his book. If you're interested, you can look into it. It's written in English, but this English is looks like more older style of English, so it's not exactly the easiest thing to read. The Doctrine of Chances. And even just by reading the first paragraph, we quickly realize that uh, back, back then, the standards of mathematical rigor were not what they were today. So in his introduction, he says the probability of an event is greater, or LEF, not sure what that means, probably less, according to the number of chances by which it may, may happen, compared, uh, interesting the way they write the word compared, with the number of all chances by which it may either happen or fail. Thus, if an event has three chances to happen and two to fail, the probability of its happening may be eliminated. Eliminated? Estimated? I'm not sure, to be three over five. 
therefore, if the probability of happening and failing are added together, the sum will always be equal to unity, equal to one. So it's sometimes interesting to read older math books for historical purposes, and then you see that it is much more confusing. As far as getting any value of this book, I've never read it. It would be interesting to read it, but I would just assume that everything that is present in this book is already well-known mathematics. So you're not going to learn any new mathematics that you would not learn in a typical math course or a modern textbook, but it's just interesting to look at history as it was developing and to also sometimes look at the notation. So they did have a notation for a fraction, but when they did multiplication, they did it with a cross symbol. So it's interesting to look at that. But the, it looks like they do use somewhat uh, more modern algebra notation. But anyway, I think the history of this is quite interesting. And to also add to the history of this is that uh, De Moiver derived, almost derived, what is now known as Sterling's approximation. So Sterling's approximations that n factorial can be estimated. So the ratio between n factorial can be estimated by 2 pi n, n divided by e to the n. And this is about 1. But of course, Strictly speaking, this is a, a imprecise. So you make this precise by saying it's equal to 1 plus some error, epsilon of n, and you want to put a bound. And then you say where epsilon of n is bounded by something. So if you look at the Wikipedia page on Sterling's approximation, it says you can bound this error function by 1 over 12n. The constant does not really matter to us. And the only thing that we will need in the derivation of the Moivre's theorem is we will simply need that it's bounded by some constant divided by n. And we often use what is known as the big O notation in analysis. So the way we write this is we write big O of 1 over n. So all this means is that we have an error function Right? It's just whatever the, the extra small little bit that is missing to turn that into an equality. This is the error function. That the error function can be dominated by 1 over n. So it's 1 over n times some constant. The constant we do not care about. So this is that's the way we write it. So in many instances in analysis, when we're doing estimates, it's not the constant that matters so much. It's the term that dominates it that matters more. So this is why this notation becomes very useful. If you want to maybe get a better numerical estimate and say how close it is, then you would care about what the constant is. But if you're doing a limiting type of an argument, the constant often, often does not play a role. So what did De Moivre do? So De Moivre noticed that n factorial, which naturally comes up in probabilistic questions. And what he had, it was really, he had some constant. So he had this, he had radical n, and he had some constant. So de Moivre, de Moivre uh, did not say what c was. I should just caution you, this constant and that constant are different. So I should really remove that. There was some constant for which that was true. And then later, James Sterling showed that this constant is the square root of 2 pi. And nowadays, that is known as Sterling's approximation. So I hope that if we have time, cannot make any promises. I have no idea how long these lectures go on for. As you notice, some of them go on for quite some time because we like to be very detailed. People like that. That uh, in deriving Sterling's approximation, 
So there's like two steps in deriving Sterling's approximation. The first step is showing that such a constant exists. And then the second step is then finding what the constant is. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Sterling's approximation is extremely hard to derive in a direct manner. So the easiest way, the most natural way, is in the process of proving de Moivre's theorem. That's actually how de Moivre himself was led to Sterling's approximation. That's quite common in math, that you, instead of proving something directly, you're working on something else, and it's, it's that something else which makes it easier to, de uh, to derive the result. But if you just want to derive Sterling's approximation in and of itself without any context of probability theory, the central limit theorem, or anything like that, then it's much more difficult to show. And I'm hoping that if we have time, we'll go through how one can derive Sterling's approximation. And if you look at like the Wikipedia page for Sterling's approximation, you will see it's so much easier because we're doing it probabilistically. So that that's, was the two things that, that de Moivre did. He got the central limit theorem really up to a constant. And then later on, people determined what that constant was. What I would like to do now is, so let us, let us give a heuristic derivation of this theorem. And then uh, make it rigorous. You want to motivate what you're doing first, and then the questionable steps you justify. And this is closer to the way it was derived historically, because de Moivre, I did not read the book, but I seriously doubt that he justified it in a rigorous manner by today's standards. He probably had some heuristic derivation of it where he kept on using approximations and then he got something in the end, but it was not what a modern and analysis derivation would often be. So now let's focus on the derivation. So let's remove this and switch to the topic of deriving it. In doing this derivation, we will have to compute the probability that our random walk at time n occupies some integer. And recall that the integers that the random walk can take on occur between negative n and n. And furthermore, it has to have the same even and odd parity as n itself. So this derivation is a little bit annoying in the sense you have to do it twice. You have to do it for even ones, for even n, and then you have to do it for odd n. It's almost the same derivation. So let's say for simplicity, for simplicity, let's assume that n is even, and so i is even. So that means that we can write n is equal to 2m and i equal to 2j, where j is now an integer between m and negative m, but it's not necessarily even. Because i is even. When you divide an even number by 2, it does not necessarily have to be even anymore. So then j is just a number between negative m and m. So then our probability will become that this is then equal to the probability that the random walk at 2m is equal to 2j. And the, that exact probability in the symmetric case is given by 2 to the 2m. So it's 2 to the n, but here it's 2 to the 2m. And then we have 2m choose. So it goes 2m plus 2j divided by 2. So that's the way that it goes. But when you simplify everything, this is just going to be m plus j. So that's going to be the exact probability. This is where the factorials come in. So when we write this out, this is 2 to the 2m. Then we have 2m factorial divided by m plus j factorial, m minus j factorial. 
And now we're going to do something that is a little bit vague, going to be a bit unclear. Intuitively, it will make sense. And we'll make it more clear when we derive this again a bit more rigorously. So we're going to say that we will assume that m is that m is large. It's a large integer, and j and the absolute value of j is small compared to m. So why are we doing this? Well, because then in the in the numerator that is a large number, 2m is a large number, and this will mean that this is also a large number because m is large, but j is small compared to m. So when you add them together, that's it, the j is insignificant. It does not really alter m by that much. So you can imagine that m is like a million and j is 100. It has a small effect on m. And this one is also large. So we're assuming that j in absolute value, because j could be even, it could be positive or negative. The random walk can be in a positive or negative direction from the origin. But so we're assuming that the absolute value of j is small. So this is going to be large. Now, what's the point of saying that these are large? It's just going to mean that we can use Sterling's approximation here. Sterling's approximation becomes more accurate the larger the number becomes. So we would therefore say that this is approximately equal to, by Sterling's approximation, 2 to the 2m. And now we just go ahead with Sterling's approximation. So this is the square root of 2 pi. So what is Sterling's approximation? That n factorial, capital N factorial, is asymptotic. So asymptotic means that if you divide them, so I should do this with division, that n factorial, when divided by the square root of 2 pi capital N, n divided by e raised to the n, is approximately equal to 1. This is actually a great approximation. You can check it on Wolfram Alpha. It, it works quite well. In our case, capital N is 2m. So this is 2 pi 2m divided by. Now, if you do not know the correct constant, so De Moivre did not know the correct constant, you just do this derivation with that constant, and you get the central limit theorem up to that constant, and then you figure out later what that constant is. So you have 2 pi 2m. Then you will have 2m raised to the 2m divided by e. And then here we have square root of 2 pi m plus j, m plus j over e to the m plus j. Here we have, and now we do the same thing for this one. We have 2 pi m minus j m minus j over e, m minus j. So we have all of that. And now this is going to be a homework problem. This is not difficult. You're going to show, and this is a homework problem. This is actually very easy. All it is, it's just algebra. But you can already see there's a lot of cancellation. So for instance, you have e to the 2m, you have e to the m, and you have e to the m. So the e's will cancel away. Then you have 2 pi, you have 2 pi, you have 2 pi. So the 2 pi's cancel away. So if you go through this, if you do the algebra, you should end up with 1 over the square root of pi, which is looking good because in the central limit theorem, the standard normal density function has exactly that factor. And then you would have radical 2m divided by m squared minus j squared. Basically, if you want to quickly see where this is, is you're just putting these together. That's how you get 2m m squared minus j squared. And then the other piece that you're going to be left with, and you can work this out, that's going to be m to the 2m divided by m plus j to the m plus j, m minus j to the m minus j. So that's up to you to do the algebra and convince yourself that this is true. It's not difficult. Now, here's what you're going to do next. So the idea is that this is small. It is j squared, but this is m squared. This is small. So this really has very little effect. So what does this imply? This implies that this particular factor can be estimated 
by the square root of 2m over m squared because you keep the numerator you keep the denominator by, but this j squared is insignificant so you ignore it so you have this and that is of course square root of 2 over the square root of m and then you have this somewhat complicated factor that arises and we want to be able to estimate something like that and to estimate that because we have exponents within exponents i'm sorry we have variables within exponents it is reasonable to take the logarithm first and make it simpler so to find to find a simpler expression for the blue fraction we will first take its lock you see we're taking this fraction and we're replacing it by this this is a lot simpler and it makes sense that this should be a good approximation to whatever that is by just simply ignoring the j we want to do something similar with this we want to replace it by something that's going to be simpler so let's take its log so if we take the log we can call this piece star and we can take the log of the thing inside it if we do that we would end up with 2m log m minus m plus j log m plus j minus m minus j log m minus j you can even treat this as a continuation of the previous homework problem because you just have to carefully work this out it's not particularly that hard and you're going to rewrite these logs a little separately you're going to rewrite this log you're going to factor out an m and be left with this and here you're going to factor out the m and you're going to be left with this like that okay so now you're going to use use the approximation that the logarithm of one plus a number is approximately equal to and this is just the Taylor series up to the second term so it's x plus x squared over 2 okay and that would mean by the way that log 1 minus x is approximately I made a mistake this should be minus and this should be minus x minus x squared over 2 because here you're replacing x by negative x so x becomes negative x but because it's being squared when you replace x by negative x you keep the negative anyway so this is the approximation provided this approximation is provided that the absolute value of that real number is smaller than one which is exactly what we have over here because j is small and m is large so when you take the fraction this is going to be something small so its absolute value will be less than one so you can do this approximation and then you're going to continue with the homework problem and you're going to show that log of the stuff in the blue and this is just algebra all you do is you take this log and you take that log you replace them by these approximations and there's a lot of things that you have to factor multiply out and you will get that this is then approximated by negative j squared divided by m which means that the thing that we have in the blue can be estimated by e to the negative j squared divided by m and that looks somewhat good because it looks like that's e to the negative x squared it's beginning to look like what we want it to so when you're looking at this derivation and you're thinking that this was done in the early stages of calculus it just makes it be a lot more impressive that he's using all of these techniques right at the beginning of calculus.
So you're just going to replace that by that, okay? And what we have shown is thus the probability that the random walk 2m is equal to 2j can be approximated by 1 over the square root of 2 pi. Then we have square root of 2 over square root of m. And then we have e to the negative j squared divided by m. So this is the approximation that we have. And what I would suggest to do, and I'll put this also on the homework problem, is to compare the exact probability of the left-hand side with the approximate probability of the right-hand side. And it is surprisingly close. Of course, you have to use numbers that are not ridiculous. If you make m be like 1,000, uh, it's going to not be able to compute it. But if you make like m be 100 or 200 or something like that, when you compute this using computer software, it will give you an estimate for that probability. And when you compare it with this, you will be shocked by how well it is. It, it give, it's like, depending how you pick the numbers, you can sometimes have them be almost indistinguishable from one another. So I just think it's really amazing that even though a lot of these steps might seem to be a little bit questionable why you're allowed to just replace it, but in the end, you get something that's a lot simpler. You're getting something that is a lot simpler than all of that factorial stuff and is shockingly close to the exact probability. So then we now continue with the derivation of the central limit theorem. So to continue, we want to find, so we want to calculate the probability that the random walk, and we're doing it up to 2m, divided by square root of 2m, is between two real numbers a and b. So we would then say that this is equal to, we're going to clear denominators, and that would be the probability that a square root of 2m is less than or equal to the random walk up to 2m, less than or equal to b square root of 2m. And to calculate those probabilities, we then have to sum over all even integers. So it's only even integers that fall within those bounds. So you will write that this is equal to the sum. This will be the probability that the random walk is equal to 2j. And 2j will have to fall between b square root of 2m and a square root of 2m. The next thing that we do is we're going to, well, first of all, I want you to appreciate that what this is actually saying, what this is saying is this inequality implies that the absolute value of J, you have to understand it's really about the absolute value of J because the numbers A and B could be positive or negative. So the integer itself could be positive or negative. So that implies that the absolute value of j is small since it is dominated by basically, if you ignore the constants, it's dominated by square root of m, which is small compared to m itself. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because when we were using Sterling's approximation all the way here at the top, I was saying that we're going to assume that m is a large integer and the absolute value of j in comparison to m is small. That's a little bit imprecise, but it does make sense that if j is dominated by the radical m, then it plays a very small role in the calculation of the factorials, an almost insignificant role. So it justifies, at least on the heuristic level, some of these calculations that are taking place. So our previous estimates make sense at least informally. And let's rewrite this a little bit. So this is the sum. Let me rewrite it with uh, only a and b. So I'm going to write a less than or equal to. So it's going to be, I'm going to divide by 2m. So it's 2j divided by radical 2m less than or equal to b. And then this probability can be replaced by our approximation, which is 1 over 
the square root of 2 pi, and then we had radical 2 over radical m. And finally, we had that exponential e to the negative j squared divided by m. Now, let's look at this quantity 2j over square root of m. Uh, let's yeah, so 2j over the square root of 2m. First of all, we can cancel the 2. So 2 over the square root of 2, square root of m. And by canceling away the, the 2 with the radical 2, that would leave us with radical 2 over radical m multiplied by j. And for notation, let's call that x subscript j. So we have a sum a less than or equal to x j less than or equal to b 1 over the square root of 2 pi square root of 2 over square root of m and I want to rewrite this in terms of of x j so since square root of 2 over square root of m times j is by definition x subscript j it would mean if we solve for j that would be the square root of m over the square root of 2 times xj and if we square both sides that would be m divided by by that okay so j squared over m is equal to then xj squared divided by 2 so we can therefore replace this using this new notation so that would be e to the negative xj squared over 2. And maybe you're beginning to see where I'm going with this. So let's just say over here, here, xj is equal to square root of 2 over square root of m times j times some integer. So let's understand what this is. So this entire sum. So this sum is a Riemann sum for the integral one over the square root of two pi e to the negative x squared over two dx. Let's see why that is. So what we do is we take the interval between a and b and we cut up, so when we form a Riemann sum, we cut up the interval into small pieces, into small regions, like this. And we have a point, end up, so if we have one of these points that we're calling xj for some integer j, the next one that we have is what we call xj plus 1. So we're cutting them into regions. And we talk about the spacing between these points. So if we do xj plus 1 minus xj, how adjacent are these points that we're picking in the Riemann sum? So this would be square root of 2 over square root of m, j plus 1 minus square root of 2 over square root of m, j. And that will then simplify to be radical 2 over radical m. So delta x, the spacing on the x-axis, is radical 2 over radical m. Okay, so the idea then is that this plays the role of the approximation for that infinitesimal gap dx. This one will then be the function evaluated discreetly at those points. And the constant will just remain as it is. So if you look at what's going on, that's exactly what we have. This is e to the negative xj squared over 2. These are the discrete points that are used to approximate the Riemann sum. And radical 2 over radical m is playing the role of a discrete approximation for this infinitesimal dx. The constant stays what it is, and you're summing up the points. So that's why it gets estimated by that interval. And that right there is the whole, is the whole derivation. That What we've shown is that this integral will then approximate that. But that is the exact probability of the random walk 
falling in with between these two numbers a and b so that's that is what we have derived so it's a somewhat nice derivation but now we have to do the hard work and we actually have to justify i mean the difficult step of course is we have all of these estimates that we have to justify and then at the very end we also have to justify when we are saying i mean the idea of course is that this is a riemann sum but we have to show that in the limit as m goes to infinity it does give you that so these are the things that we have to justify, but at least the heuristic is there. It does make a lot of sense. It's actually a fairly nice derivation. Uh, so now let's switch to the next question of at going back through this whole proof and being a little bit more careful with the approximations that we're doing. So here we have to keep track of the error bounds throughout the argument. I found something interesting on the central limit theorem that I did not know. I wanted to show this to you first before we prove the Moivers theorem. According to Wikipedia, they say that there's some interesting history, according to this mathematician, that the very first version was by de Moiver, and it was published in 1733. And he introduced this standard normal density function to approximate the number of heads in a fair coin. So that's really what we're doing because we're doing a fair, asymmetric random walk. And it was nearly forgotten until Laplace rescued it. And he written about it in this book, which was published in 1812, almost a hundred years later. So it uh, looks like I was incorrect when I said earlier that Laplace did not know about the Moiver. He did came across the Moiver and then he written about it, but it goes on to say here that Laplace expanded upon his approximation and he did it for any binomial distribution. Not necessarily one that is just symmetric, but for any random variable uh, that is a binomial, even if it is more favored towards heads or tails, you can still do an approximation with the normal. You just have to, uh, restate it a little bit differently. And then there's also another interesting mention here by Galton, who calls it, who calls this law, the law of frequency of error. And if you're not familiar with this person, he illustrated the central limit theorem in this very famous contraption called the Galton machine or the Galton board. There's a nice bit where you take sand and you throw it on that board and you can see that by randomness, every piece of sand randomly moves to the left or to the right. And when they stack together, we can just see this one more time. And when they stack together, they produce for you something that begins to resemble a normal curve. Of course, here we can say it does not look very much like a normal curve because it's too spaced out, but at least it illustrates it uh, in an actual experiment where you get to see it because the idea here is that as the sand goes down and it hits these boards, it's a fair coin toss whether you go to the left or right. So it is conceivable that something keeps on going all the way to the left and it ends up down here or it goes all the way to the right. But usually it's somewhere in the middle. And there's a very famous saying in statistics, if you've ever heard this phrase, regression to the mean, I would first like to start with what some books call the local limit theorem. We're going to prove this one first, and then we will use it to prove the Moivers theorem. Here's the way that it goes. It says that you fix real numbers A and B with A less than B. You can even do this when the real numbers are plus or minus infinity, though the proof will have to be a little bit different, but let's not go there. So we'll fix real numbers A and B. And we're going to construct, we're going to define the following set I M. Let me add over here for an integer m bigger than or equal to 1, we're going to define this set. This is going to be the set of integers with the property that 
j is between b square root of m and a square root of m. Then we have, so we're going to calculate the probability that our random walk after 2m steps is equal to 2j. And we're going to compare it with what we're approximating with it with, which is 1 over the square root of 2 pi. And we had square root of 2m. So this is exactly what we had in our heuristic derivation, e to the minus j squared over m. The idea is that these two fractions are close to 1. And we subtract a 1 over here. So these two fractions are close to each other. So if you subtract a 1, then this thing should be small. And what we want to say is that this is small in a uniform sense, in the sense that it's true for every j that falls within that range. The way you do that is you just write maximum j in i m. So you're going to calculate the maximum possible error that this fraction has away from 1. And then you're saying that the limit of this, that the limit of this goes to 0 as m goes to infinity. So that's what you're saying more carefully, that if you restrict yourself to those integers that fall into this range, then all of these probabilities, when approximated with this quantity, are close to 1 in a uniform way. And it's called the local limit theorem because these are local probabilities. Those are the probabilities at a particular integer. We need to understand that when you're using the central limit theorem, you're approximating something with the standard normal density curve, which does not have local probabilities because it's a continuous, it's an absolutely continuous random variable. But here, because these are discrete random variables, you could calculate the local probabilities. There are going to be some positive numbers, and that's why we call this the local limit theorem. We're going to prove this first. And then after we prove the local limit theorem, we will then be able to go ahead and prove the De Moivre theorem. But we need to be able to prove this first. Here's the proof of this theorem. Let So we're going to fix real numbers A and B. And then we're going to set IM to be the collection of integers that fall within this range by Sterling's approximation we can write that k factorial is equal to here we do not assume that k is big or small because that's not a rigorous statement so rather we just write k factorial in the form we'll write it in this form that this ratio whatever the error is to the k, that this should be k over e, that this is equal to 1. And then you have an error function where the error function can be dominated by some constant over k. We do not really care what that constant is because we're going to be taking limits. So that constant will not really play much of a role. And as I remarked, in analysis, we often use the notation. We just write this as O1 over K. That just means that there is an error function. It depends on K. And that error function can be dominated by 1 over K up to some constant. So then the probability that W2M is equal to 2J. So if J belongs to this set, then this probability 
that the ray on the walk is equal to 2j. I should say that I am assuming in the statement of this theorem that we're doing it for an even number of steps. One would then have to do the proof for an odd number of steps as well as a separate proof, but it's almost the same identical proof, so we're not going to bother to go there. So then that probability is exactly equal to 1 over 2 to the 2m, and we have 2m m plus j. Then we write it out in the following form. This is 2m factorial, m plus j factorial, m minus j factorial. And this is equal to, and this is where you use Sterling's approximation. And I leave this up for you on the homework. This is just algebra calculation. This is exactly what we did when we did our heuristic, that you're going to end up getting 1 over the square root of pi. Then you're going to get the square root of 2m over m squared minus j squared. Then you're going to get this exponential factor, m to the 2m over m plus j to the m plus j, and then m minus j to the m minus j. I, I should have said something earlier that one could be concerned that how do you know that these quantities are positive? Uh, j, after all, is an integer, so it could be positive or negative. So how do you know this is positive? Well, because in the statement of the theorem, m is going off to infinity. So it is true that even though if the constants a and b are very large, it is conceivable that this integer is so big that it's larger than m. However, if the a and the b remain fixed, and m is going to infinity, uh, it does not matter how big the a and the b is. Whatever integers you get j that fall within those bounds, they will never be able to catch up to m. So for large enough m, these are going to be positive integers, so the factorials are going to be defined. And in particular, uh, th this is a positive denominator, provided that m is sufficiently large. So that's not going to be an issue for us. So we have this. But in the heuristic derivation, we just put approximately over here, and we just left it like this. But when you're writing a more careful proof, you have to use equalities. And the way you fix it is you just attach this extra factor, which will consist of the error bounds, 1 plus epsilon of 2m divided by 1 plus epsilon m plus j and 1 plus epsilon m minus j. That's what you're going to have. And the next step that you're going to show is you're going to look at the following pieces. Let's call this piece one. Let's call this piece the second factor. And let's call this the third factor. So the third factor is the one that consists of error bounds. And let's focus on each one. Let us consider the third factor. We can write this third factor in the following way. It's 1 plus, and it's some error function that depends on m and j. So whatever this is, well, here's the idea. OK, so here's the idea. The idea is that this, this piece and that piece, they're both small. Because as m goes to infinity, j is small compared to m. So, And because these error bounds are about 1 over m, it means that if m is large, these numbers become small. So these are small numbers, and you just have 1, you have 1, and then you have 1 plus something that uh, is basically 1 over, it's a constant over m. So what we're saying is that you can write whatever those functions are, they would be about 1 plus an error bound, and whatever this error bound is, as you can see, it depends both on m and on j. But we can say where that bound is bounded by some constant divided by m for all, for all j in that set. So this is what we call a uniform bound. That's a uniform bound. That even though it depends both on m and on j. The point is, because j is small compared to m, you can, this whatever this leftover bound is, it could be written in a way not to depend on the j. Okay, so that's something that one has to show. Okay, so we can write, so I'm going to leave that up to you, part of the homework problem. So it'll just be a homework problem with multi steps. Uh, and then you'll just justify the steps. It's not difficult to show, you just have to actually show. It's not very exciting. Then you do part one. So with part one, the first factor, right, 
the first factor that we have. So this first factor, if you look at it, it's m, it's 2m divided by m squared. So what we're claiming is that you're able to write this factor as the square root of 2 over m, and then you have 1 plus some leftover bit. Now, in the notation of analysis, let's just conveniently write this as O of, is going to be O of 1 over radical m. Okay? And the third factor in the notation of analysis, let's just write it as O of 1 over m. That's what we're saying over here. And both of these bounds, and both of these, these are uh, going to be uniform bounds for all j in that set. That it does not matter. So even though whatever error function you're getting, it depends on m and j, that it can be written in this way. Okay, so that would be up to you to show that. It's not difficult. It's, I mean, it just goes back to the idea that j is small, so it makes a very small contribution, and then you're basically left with 2 divided by the square root of m. That's like the dominant piece. That's why it's a 1. And then the error piece is small. It's, there's a small error here. And what about the second one? Well, the second one takes a little bit of work. But what you're going to do is, and this is going back, so for the second one, you're going to take the log of the second one, of the middle factor that we had before. This is what we had in the heuristic derivation. And you're going to show that you can write it as e that it's a negative j squared over m plus o of 1 over the square root of m. And here the hint would be that for if you have a real number that's smaller than 1, then the log of 1 plus x is equal to x minus x squared over 2 plus O of x cubed. So this is just coming from the Taylor's theorem that the remainder is dominated of this form. And so if you work out the details, you can show that if you take log of all of this, you can write it like this. And again, it's important that this is uniform, that even though the error does depend on j and m, it's possible to dominate it by something that's uniform for all j. And you can write it in this way. And so what we basically have is thus, what we see in the end is if you put everything together, uh, for the second factor, you're going to exponentiate this. You're going to have that this is 1. You're going to see that the probability that 2m is equal to 2j. So for j in this set, that this probability can then be written as 1 over the square root of 2 pi. Then we're going to have our first factor, which is the square root of 2 over m, multiplied by 1 plus o, 1 over the square root of m. Then we have our exponential factor, e to the negative j squared over m. And then it's e raised to something that's bounded by 1 over the square root of m. And the third factor, uh, because basically you are, you, you remove the lock. So it's the exponent of this and the exponent. It's just the error term that's dominated in this kind of a way. And then finally, you have the third piece that can be written like that. So that would be 1 plus O, 1 over M. So this is what you have. And this and these bounds are uniform. They're independent of whatever J you pick in that set. And now we're going to use that E to the X is 1 plus X plus other terms. So e to the o, 1 over the square root of n, would then be 1 plus o, 1 over the square root of n, square root of m. That's how you can write it. So when you put all of this together in the end, so we're going to just replace it by that. What we see is this piece 
is equal to, and we multiply this out. You'll have one, 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 and then the remaining factors, we have one over radical M, one over M, and one over radical M. So we just have to realize that one over M goes to zero faster than one over radical M. So this will dominate. So we just write the most dominant one. So it'll be one plus O, one over radical M. And what we see from here is that star, the thing that we are interested in, minus one. And when you look at the maximum possible error that you have over all of the integers in that set, it would be dominated by some constant divided by the square root of m, right? That's all we're doing. We're just bringing the one over to the other side. And so in the limit, so thus the limit as m goes to infinity of the max, the maximum error of what we're actually interested in, which is the probability that the random walk is equal to 2j in comparison to what we're approximating it by within one in the limit of that goes to zero uniformly over all integers in that set. So that is the proof of the local limit theorem. Uh, I, I leave some small details for you to check. So these are like the three things you have to check. You first have to do the algebra, which it's almost like the heuristic derivation, except you have to carry around the error bounds, the error terms. And then you have to show you have these uniform bounds for all three. For this one, you have to use Taylor series with this remainder. And then this is what you end up getting. And then this extra piece, you just replace it by that. And the result ends up working out for you in the end. And that would be the proof, as you can see in the end, this is exactly the conclusion that we were looking for. This, this is what we call the local limit theorem. And with the local limit theorem, we can then use it to go ahead and to prove the uh, de Moivre's theorem about how you approximate it with the standard normal density function. Theorem, de Moivre. We're going to fix real numbers a less than or equal to b. And we claim that if we compute the probability that the standardized random walk is between a and b in the limit as m goes to infinity converges to the integral of the standard normal density function where phi of x is given by this function. A very small remark. I did mention this before, but just to say this again, notice that I'm assuming that the random walk takes an even number of steps. That's just done for notational simplicity. You can redo the proof for an odd number of steps separately and then you have the theorem proven for any number of steps. But it's going to be too repetitive to redo it for an odd number of steps. Here's how the proof goes. And I do have to warn you that this proof is technical. It's not that easy. It's actually quite technical. It's one thing to give a heuristic justification for why this is the correct function that one needs to integrate to get an approximation for whatever that probability is. Uh, justifying it becomes harder. Now, what we need to do, and this is a typical proof and analysis, is we're going to let epsilon be bigger than zero, and we need to show that the sequence that we're working with, so this is our sequence that depends on m, So this sequence is within epsilon of its limit. This is what we're claiming is the limit for all m sufficiently large. Now, as is the case 
in many proofs and analysis, we often do not show that something is smaller than epsilon directly. You've probably seen many proofs where you show rather that something is smaller than two epsilon or maybe some constant times epsilon or something like that. So rather, we will prove that the quantity, uh, this star represents all of this, the difference between the sequence and its limit is less than or equal to some constant times epsilon. This constant will only depend on a and b. It's not going to depend on anything else. It's not going to depend on n. This is just some constant from the very beginning. And we will also have plus some other constant, possibly a different constant that does not matter, divided by radical m. And then you can modify the choice of epsilon to be epsilon over 2, and you can choose the m to be so large that whatever this is is smaller than epsilon over 2. So this is sufficient to prove convergence. I just bring it up because this is going to be like one of those typical proofs and analysis where when you go through the estimates, it does not actually work out to be smaller than epsilon, but it's not a big deal. But that's what we're going to have. The important thing about these constants, as you will see, they only depend on the choices on the A and B at the very, very beginning. They have no dependency on the M or anything like that. So that's what we're going to show, and that will complete the proof. So here's how we do it. So we're going to write this probability in the following way. We're going to write it as the probability A radical 2M is less than or equal to the random walk at 2M less than or equal to B radical 2M. And now we're going to set the set IM, which is going to be the set consisting of integers with the property that 2J, so the even integers, are less than or equal to B square root of 2M and greater than A square root of 2M. Just like that. Then it will follow that the probability in which we are interested in calculating can be expressed as a sum. We're going to look at all integers in that set. And we're going to sum up the probability that the random walk is equal to 2j. It has to be an even integer. j just consists of those of the multiples of 2. Well, it's the part that's without the 2, whereas the actual values are multiples of 2. That's what we have. I want you to understand that these probabilities over here, these are local probabilities. These are probabilities that occur at one particular integer, whereas this entire sum of all of them, this is a global probability that, it, that the required event is satisfied. So you sum over the local probabilities. Okay, so now we're going to use what we called the local limit theorem. The local limit theorem is about describing the local probabilities of these. So by the local limit theorem, we can write, we can ex express these local probabilities in the form that it's 1 over radical 2 pi square root of 2 over square root of m e to the negative j squared over m. But that is not entirely correct. We have a leftover error. 1 plus an error function. Let's call this error function delta. It depends on m, and it depends on j. If you're confused by that, 
this is just coming from the way let me first finish what i want to say and then i'll explain it so that the error piece at the very end delta mj if you look at its magnitude and absolute value and one looks at the maximum of all integers over that set whatever that is it is bounded by some constant which we do not care what it is over the square root of m this constant depends on a and b at the very very beginning so you choose the interval at the very start and that determines your constant this constant does not depend on j it does not depend on m so that's what we have so in particular as m increases this is going to zero uh, now if you're confused by this you just have to recall what the local limit theorem said the way we had it is we've said that if you look at the comparison between that probability and what we're approximating it with that this is approximately equal to one in a uniform sense that if you subtract one and then you look at the maximum error that you get over that set we saw that that entire expression approaches zero well the error is exactly what we're calling delta mj it's an error that depends on m and on j uh, and the way we showed that it approaches zero is we were able to bound this by a universal constant divided by radical m so that's just coming directly from the local limit theorem so that's what we have the next thing that we're going to do is uh, suppose that this set of integers i m so let's write out this set it's a set of integers because it's a set of integers that fall between two real numbers this is a real number and that is a real number so that means there's a finite number of integers that exist between these two real numbers so you just write out this integer there's a smallest integer in the list and there's a largest integer in the list so let's write those out as j1 that's the smallest integer in the list all the way up to the largest integer in the list which we're going to call jn n is just the number of integers that make up that set so then the number n itself is going to be bounded by some constant and again this constant simply depends on a and b it does not depend on m it's a universal constant times the square root of m let's understand why that's the case because you're essentially counting how many integers fall between two numbers just think of this let's say the left endpoint is 13.7 and the right endpoint is 6.5 how many integers fall within within that range well you just take the difference it's basically 60 minus 13. that's basically how many integers you have so what's the length of this interval well it's that point minus that point it also gets divided in half because you're looking at the even integer so you have half as many but half is just a constant ultimately it's just some constant multiplied by radical m because that's the factor by which you're rescaling the size of that interval so the number of integers that makes up that set is bounded by a constant times the square root of m okay we have that so now let's rewrite the set a little bit differently okay so recall I'm going to write this again over here because I do not want to scroll back up that I am is the collection of integers that fall between these two numbers so if some integer belongs to that set then that means by definition it has to fall between b square root of 2m and a square root of 2m now for convenience we're going to divide everything by this by 2 
So let's divide everything by two. In fact, let's divide everything by let's divide everything by the square root of two m. So that would mean that a is less than or equal to square root of m, square root of two over square root of m times j, less than or equal to b, square root of two over the square root of m. So we're just rewriting this. I'm sorry, I made a small mistake. This is not supposed to be here. Right, you're just doing a rationalization trick. Two divided by square root of two is square root of two, and then you're left with square root of m. And now let's set, by definition, xj. By definition, this will just represent this point square root of two over square root of m times j. Now, before we continue, a picture would be very helpful here. So we have a number line. We have a number line. We have the number zero somewhere. We do not care what it is. And then we're going to introduce spacings that are square root of two over square root of m apart. The key point to realize is that as m goes to infinity, this fraction becomes very small. So you, you begin introducing these spacings. So you have zero somewhere, you're gonna have zero somewhere, and you have a spacing. This is, so you just keep, you introduce these spacings like this in both directions. But you just introduce these spacings. So this one would be square root of two over square root of m. The next one would be square root of two over square root of m times two, and so on. You introduce these spacings. And this is exactly what we're calling xj, right? That's exactly where xj are being located. It's the spacings that we're getting. So this one is technically x0, because you, you're, it's just a multiple of zero. So this is x0, this is x1, this is x2, this is x3, x4. This one is x negative one, x negative two. Now, a and b are real numbers. These are real numbers. And they're somewhere. So a is somewhere. Now, it's conceivable that a could itself be one of these spacings, but it does not matter. I'm going to draw it with the assumption that it is not. It really does not matter. It's not going to affect the argument. So a is somewhere. So let's say a is located right over here and b is located right over there. And you're looking at all of these spacings that fit between A and B, because this is what we're calling XJ. So we're looking at all spacings XJ that fit between A and B. Okay, that's what we have. Now, the smallest integer, right, and this set IM, it describes all of the integers that fall between those bounds. Okay, so in this particular picture, to use this very specific example, this is x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. So we're good. this is going to be x negative 5. So that would mean in this particular case that im would consist of the integers negative 5, negative 4, all the way up to 4, as you can see. So it's just the indices, it's the multiples of these spacings that fit between these two real numbers. That's what they are. Okay, so that's that's what we have. And so we have this. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to rewrite this. We're going to rewrite this expression 
in terms of this variable xj, this discrete variable xj. So then, I want you to understand that this diagram, that's not part of the proof, of course. That's just to give you an idea of what we're trying to say. So then the quantity 1 over the square root of 2 pi, and we had square root of 2 over square root of m, e to the negative we had over there. Let me scroll back up, see what I wrote. I wrote negative j squared over m. can be rewritten as 1 over the square root of 2 pi, square root of 2 over square root of m, e to the negative xj squared over 2. If you're confused by that, let's just explain that. That's what xj is equal to. If I square both sides, then I get xj squared is 2 over m j squared. Right, 2 over j m squared. So what are we getting? We want to get j squared over m. So in order to get j squared over m, we have to divide by 2. So j squared divided by m is exactly xj squared over 2. So that's the way we end up getting this. Also, if I take, if I take xj plus 1, if I take the next spacing, so if I have x2 and I go to the next one, and I sub subtract spacing, then we would get the distance between the spacing, which happens to be square root of 2 over square root of m. And let's denote that by definition by just delta x. So 1 over the square root of 2 pi, square root of 2 over square root of m, e to the negative j squared over m, can be written as 1 over the square root of 2 pi. We have e to the negative xj squared over 2 times delta x. Because this factor is what we're calling delta x, and this can be rewritten in terms of this discrete variable xj. Furthermore, we can go a little bit further, and we can write this more simply as just the function phi. Phi, this is the standard normal density function, evaluated at xj. If you're confused by that, let me just show you again what that is. I'm going to scroll all the way back up. This is the definition of phi of x. But here, x is allowed to be a real number, whereas what we're doing, we're using those discrete points on the real line. And we're just evaluating it at xj. So it's phi of xj times delta x. That's what we have. So that's how we can express this. The next thing that we use is we're going to use uniform continuity. We're going to use uniform continuity. I actually think I probably should have used this earlier. But let me say this. So since this function phi is continuous, on the interval from A to B, we can find a real number, let's call it theta, bigger than 0, so that if x comma y belong to that interval and the distance between x minus y is smaller than this number theta, then phi of x minus phi of y is smaller than epsilon. This epsilon was chosen at the very start of the proof. And I think I probably should have written this sentence at the beginning of the proof because I'm going to choose the m depending on the theta. Though everything that I've written above will carry through. So even though the proof is not written the best way, all of the previous material is going to be unaffected. And now I'm going to say that you're going to choose the integer m so large 
that square root of 2 over the square root of m is smaller than this number theta. So that's the spacing that we have. So if we choose this m sufficiently large, we can make it smaller than theta. And if, it's small, and if the spacings are smaller than theta, then it will mean by continuity, if any two points on this interval are within theta, then their images of the function, of the continuous function, p is a continuous function, is smaller than epsilon. Technically, this is called uniform continuity, if you know the difference between that and regular continuity. But if not, it's not a big deal. Right, this is essentially continuity, that you could make the images of the function be as small as you want, provided that the input points are sufficiently close together. Okay, so why are we doing this? What, what's the reason for why we're doing this? So it goes back to this sum that we're trying to, we're trying to calculate the difference between the sum of local probabilities of uh, what happens with the random walk and what we're claiming is the limiting value. That's what we're looking at. We want to show that we can make this be sufficiently small if you make m go to infinity. The way we achieve this is we use the local limit theorem to write these out. So this would be equal to I'm going to need more space, so I'll write it like this. This would be equal to the sum j in i m. And each of these local probabilities, as we saw, they can be expressed like this. That's the whole point. These are the local probabilities, and they can be expressed in this way. So we can write the, these as phi of xj multiply times delta x, 1 plus the error term. So there's some kind of error term over here that depends on j and m. Right, so it's not that this is exactly equal to that. There's a little bit of an error that has to be taken into account. Minus, and this is going to be the clever part of the proof. Actually, there's a lot of clever part of the proof. This is going to be the clever part of the proof. This goes back to that picture that we drew before. I'm going to redraw the picture for you over here. So remember that we have x0, we have x1, we have our spacings. Like this. And in between these spacings, we have these numbers a and b. And we're going to split uh, the very first, yeah, we're going to split, we're going to split the integral into pieces. We're going to write this as the integral from a to the to the smallest number in this list. Now, I'm going to scroll up, unfortunately, for a moment to show you the notation. The set of integers, it's a finite set. The smallest integer in that list, we're calling it j1. It could be a positive or a negative number. It does not matter. j2 is the next consecutive integer in that list, and that continues until we get to the largest integer in that list. So that would be our list of integers. So even though here we're writing x negative 3, the negative 3 is really the first integer in the set of integers that we're using. So we're going from a to x subscript j1. So we're going to write this as x subscript j1 of the function phi of x dx. Then we do minus the integral. We go to the next one. This is x j1, x j2, phi of x dx, minus, and that continues, minus, we go to the last two, 
x j n minus one keep in mind n represents the number of those integers x j n phi of x dx and then minus the integral from x j n up to b of phi of x dx so all we're doing is we are rewriting we are rewriting the sum in this way and we're going to start pairing these together but before we pair anything we can rewrite these as integrals themselves in the following way each of these can be rewritten we can write this as an integral from x j to x j plus one uh, or maybe you go down it, it it's not really going to matter x j x j minus one and here i'm going to keep the function constant i'm going to keep this function constant like this and i'm going to write dx okay you're integrating a constant function these are not constant functions because i'm writing phi of x dx whereas this is the same function evaluated at the upper point so this is a constant function and the length of that interval on which we integrate is the distance between the spacings which is dx so when you do this integration you get dx now one thing that i would like to uh, mention about doing this and it's not serious you you might notice it and it might initially bother you but it's actually not serious is if you look at the smallest integer in the list which in this case is x negative three you're going back one more so because you're going back one more you're actually escaping outside of this interval right you're escaping outside of the interval so if the very if the smallest integer in the list is xj1 it does if you use xj0 that will just mean it's the next one over it's not part of the interval i understand that but it's not going to affect the estimate because ultimately we're going to be estimating those quantities and showing that they're small so i understand that it's it's leaving the bounds from a to b but as you will see it's not going to really affect any and now we start pairing these together we're going to use the triangle inequality we would say that this entire thing is less than or equal to and we're going to start using the triangle inequality so we start pairing these together so this one from j1 to j2 can be paired from j1 to j2 so we're going to write it like this we would say it's the integral from x j1 x j2 of phi of x2 minus phi of x dx plus right so i'm pairing i'm ignoring this one for now but i'm pairing this one with one of these in the sum then i go to the next one over so then this would be integral x j2 x j3 phi of x3 minus phi of x and so on and i'm going to have the last one in the list so the last one in the list would be x j n minus one x j n phi of x n minus phi of x dx plus and then we have leftover pieces that are left over leftover pieces so we're going to the one of the leftover pieces that does not pair with anything is this one so it's really a negative number but we are using absolute value so we would put the leftover piece as a lone piece alone by itself it does not pair with anything but that's not a problem we'll be we'll be able to show that it's small anyway it's not not a problem whatsoever then we will have plus the very last one over here that's going to be a lone piece by itself it does not pair with anything so that would be x j n to b phi of x dx 
There's going to be one more, and that's actually the one in the very, very beginning. So if you remember, I said that this index is a little bit suspicious because it goes out of bounds, but that's not a problem at all. We can still write it as the integral from x j0. So x j0 is now out of bounds from a to b, but that's perfectly fine because the function that we're using, it's still defined. It, it's still, I mean, it's just some number. I mean, the function phi is defined everywhere. That, that's not a problem at all. So this is x j1, and this is phi of x j1 dx. Okay, we have that. And we also have, and we cannot forget about this, then we have a sum of all of the error terms that we drag along with ourselves, all of the error terms. So we're going to have these pieces. So we'll have some j in im. We'll have phi of xj. There's no need to put absolute value on it because this function is already positive, times delta x times delta jm. So we're just dragging along all of those error terms. That's what it's bounded with. And there's one more triangle inequality that we can use, and that's the triangle inequality that if you put absolute value around an integral that is dominated by putting the absolute value inside the integral. So this is the triangle inequality for the integral. So you can put these absolute values actually inside the integrals themselves. You're only making the expression even bigger. So we can put the absolute values over here inside every single one of these. Uh, there's no need yet. I'll just keep it right here, like this. Here, these are, you can just keep it like that. It does not matter. So now, here is the whole point. This is where the uniform continuity is going to come into play. That, you see, every single one of these is dominated by epsilon, right? Every single one of these is dominated by epsilon. Right, so let me scroll up for you again. Where do we have this? So since phi is continuous on that interval, we can find the theta. So that if two points are within theta, then phi of x minus phi of y is less than epsilon, no matter what the two numbers are, as long as they're sufficiently close together. Now, because the spacing was chosen to be smaller than this number theta, if two points are inside a single spacing, then that means their images will automatically be smaller than epsilon. And that's actually what we have here, that these are smaller, because you see x2, uh, I wrote x2. I really meant to say xj. I'm sorry about the notation. This is supposed to be xj2. Yeah, sorry about that. xj2, xj3, xjn. Did I make a mistake somewhere else? No, this is fine. I've written it correctly over here. Yeah, I've written it correctly. Oh, I made a mistake right over there, right? But whatever. It's the point that counts. So xj2 is already in that spacing from xj1 to xj2. In fact, it's the right endpoint of the spacing. And this variable x, this real variable x, is assumed to fall inside that interval. So xj2 and x are within epsilon. So whatever this function is, it's smaller than epsilon. So each of these, this is smaller than epsilon. We can say smaller than or equal to the and epsilon. It does not matter. Less than or equal to epsilon. Less than or equal to epsilon. That's what we have over here. Now, what do we do with these? Well, this is actually, fortunately, very simple. This function phi, it's a positive function, and it's bounded by 1, right? 1 over 2 pi, and it's an exponential to a negative power. This is just bounded by 1. It's no big deal. This is less than or equal to 1. This one is less than or equal to 1. And just like that, this one is less than or equal to 1. This one is less than or equal to 1. Uh, this one is less than or equal to 1. And delta x, well, what do we know about delta x? Delta x is actually 2 over radical m. 2 over radical m. Okay, so let's put all of this together. 
So we can therefore say that this is bounded by epsilon multiplied by the spacing of the interval, delta x plus epsilon, delta x plus epsilon, delta x, and so on, epsilon, delta x. And this appears a total of n times. Actually, that's not true. It appears n minus 1 times because it's from j1 to jn minus 1, but it's an upper bound. It does not matter. We can just say it's bounded by n. Then this piece, this piece, and that piece, they're bounded by 1, and the spacing between them. Now, A is within the spacing, right? A is inside the spacing of A. Like, these are exactly what um, delta x units apart, whereas this is within delta x units apart. If you're not sure what I mean by that, let's find this picture. You see? This is like the previous one, and that's the next one. You can see that the distance between B and x4, the spacing, the distance between them is within the spacing because it's the next largest number in the list. So uh, the distance between these two endpoints is dominated by delta x. So we have a delta x, so we have what? We have plus delta x plus delta x plus delta x. That's coming from the three extraneous terms that do not really pair with anything. And then finally, we have to dominate the error. Each of these functions are dominated by 1. The delta x is exactly 2 over radical x. 2 over radical m. Then, according to the local limit theorem, this is dominated by a constant, some constant, do not care what it is, over square of m uniformly. That's the whole point. It does not matter what the j is. As j ranges over that entire set, it does not matter. But then you have to take into account how many terms you have in the set. So you have to multiply this by the size of that set. I am. It's how many integers make up the sum, because you're repeatedly summing a bunch of values that you're dominating by this. OK, and the number of integers in that set, we call that n. So now let's put all of this together. So this is less than or equal to. So we have n epsilon delta x plus 3 delta x plus 2 over square root of m times a constant over the square root of m times n. But remember what we said, how big how, how many integers do we actually have? Let me scroll back up for you again to show you that part of the proof. That was actually at the very beginning of the proof. You see, we've said that the number of integers that are living inside that set is dominated by some constant times radical m. So we're going to use that. So the n itself can be dominated by some constant times radical m times epsilon times delta x. What is delta x? It's 2 over radical m plus 3 over radical m. I'm sorry, 3 times 2 over radical m plus 2 over radical m times some constant over radical m. And n itself is dominated by some constant times radical m. And this is very nice, because even though this number is big, it cancels with this number. And so what we see is that this is less than or equal to some universal constant chosen at the very start times epsilon plus. And then this is 6 plus 2 times a constant. And the nice thing about this is we have some cancellation, as you can see. We have cancellation with that one and with that one. And so we have some constant. You put it all together, it's going to be some constant probably a different constant, we really do not care, over the square root of m. And that is exactly what we wanted. Now, what was the piece on the left? The piece on the left, you probably already forgot because this was a long proof, but the piece on the left was just the probability that the standardized random walk 
is between A and B. In comparison, it's the difference between that sequence and its supposed limit, which was this. And as you can see, we were able to dominate the difference between the sequence and its limit by an expression of this type. And then by making, since we can make epsilon be arbitrarily small, and we could make, make square root of m arbitrarily small, and these constants are universal constants chosen from the very start, and they never change. They do not depend on anything other than the a and b at the very start. You could make this entire number be as small as you want. So we were able to show that this sequence therefore converges in the limit to that. That is the limit of that sequence of numbers. And that concludes with the proof of the Demoiver theorem. And I think this is very nice. There's absolutely no hand waving over here. We have justified every single step of the argument in a completely rigorous way. And that's nice to see that done. Unfortunately, class, we have no time to discuss the proof of the Moivre's theorem when we allow the a and the b limits in the interval to be plus or minus infinity. That would take more work, and this lecture is already long enough. And I did say that you can derive Sterling's approximation. Sterling's approximation really follows from this. Because the way you end up getting Sterling's approximation is when you look at the probability that the random walk is located between infinity and negative infinity, this probability should be 1. And it's supposed to converge in the limit to the integral of this function e to the negative x squared over 2 dx. But when one uses a weaker form of Sterling's approximation without knowing what the correct constant is, you really get it up to a constant. And since this is 1, this is just a constant that makes this integrate to 1. And since we know that this integrates to square root of 2 pi, that's the way we derive Sterling's approximation. So basically, there is a simpler version of Sterling's approximation where you can show that n factorial is equal to that formula up to some mysterious constant. Right? You just say there's some constant, that, uh, but you do not say what the value of it is. And then if you happen to know that the Moivre's theorem is true even when you have infinite limits as well, then that really would then complete the derivation. Uh, we just do not have time to go there, unfortunately as these lectures become too long. And that's enough to be said on this topic.